So these are some additional notes which will practice our unit circle and some of the big ideas that we've learned so far. So first of all, unit circle trigonometry, it involves triangles. There's lots of these questions which tell you enough information which quadrant the angle is in. This one says cos of theta is 3 eighths and it's not in quadrant one. What quadrant is it in? And how do you know? It's not in two. It's in quadrant four and why do you say quadrant four? Because cos is positive, if you think about your cast rule, right? It's either in one or four, but it's not in quadrant one, so it has to be in quadrant four. So we can draw that angle in quadrant four, draw a triangle back to the nearest x-axis, because we always want to include our reference angle. Then if cos is three over eight, you know adjacent over hypotenuse, you could label on this triangle. How good are your a squared plus b squared equals c squared skills coming? What goes inside that square root? Square root of 55. How did you do that? Okay, good. I was hoping you didn't say I did 8 minus 3 twice and got 5 both times. <laughs> You're right. 64 minus 9 is 55. And now that we have our triangle, we can say I know sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, and because it's in quadrant four, it would be negative. And tan of theta is opposite over adjacent, and because it's in quadrant four, it would be negative as well. Is the point root three over three, root six over three, on the unit circle? Now, the number one mistake that students make in this one is they think, they look on the actual one they've drawn, and that point never shows up. So they say, no, it's not on the unit circle. But we have to be careful because if you think about the unit circle, we've only memorized this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and then, right? Those are the ones you've memorized. But can you see that there are infinite amount of other points that are on there that we didn't memorize. So how do we tell if a point is on the unit circle or not? Well, we could use one of the big ideas. What did we learn from the unit circle? We learned, right, when we did a random triangle where this radius is 1, that this is x and this is y, the equation of the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1, which relates to the big idea that, oops, that's a bad looking theta, cos squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. So if this is on the unit circle, then this squared plus this squared would have to equal 1. We can check it out. If I square this and I square this, what do I get? Root 3 over 3 squared is 3 over 9. Root 6 over 3 times root 6 over 3 will be 6 over 9. 3 over 9 plus 6 over 9 is 9 over 9. Anybody know what 9 over 9 is? It's equal to 1. So we can write a statement. Is it on the unit circle? Yes, it is on the unit circle. If it wasn't equal to 1, then you could tell that it wasn't on the unit circle. If there are an infinite amount of points on the unit circle and an infinite amount of points that aren't on the unit circle, 
Does that mean if you guessed, you'd have a 50% chance of getting it right? <laughs> That's kind of messed up math. All right. Um, do you want to know something interesting about 9 over 9? Or do you want to just keep going? 9 over 9? Okay. First of all, I'm going to... I'm going to ask you which is bigger, 0.9 repeated or 1? They're the same number? Okay. They are the same number. Is that weird? Would you think that 1 is? Most people say, I think 1 is bigger because the other one's a decimal. And one should be bigger. So totally understand if you would say they're not the same number. But I'm going to show you that they are the same number. And I'm going to show you with increasing plausibility. OK? And this is the reason I thought of it. OK? Does anybody know how to change 1 over 9 to a decimal? If you go to your calculator, you could do it. Does anybody know what it is by? Point 0.1 repeated, right? And 2 over 9? Point 0.2 repeated. And 3 over 9? Point 0.3 repeated. And 4 over 9 and 5 over... And so what's 9 over 9? Point 0.9 repeated. Well, that shouldn't be very convincing. That seems like, oh, but 1 over 9 is point 0.1 repeated. I, I agree with that. 2 over 9 is point 0.2 repeated. I agree with that. But... No, 9 over 9, that's 1, Mr. JR. It shouldn't be 0.9 repeated. Okay? But it could be 0.9 repeated because if you did, if you did, um, let's say, 1 third, which is 0.3 repeated, I shouldn't have done that. It's going to take forever. And I do another 1 third. No, I'm not going to do it. And another one third. And I add them all up, one third, one third, one third. Do you agree that that's one? But if you actually add the decimals here, will you ever have to carry anything over? No. So that might be a little bit more convincing that 0.9 repeated is equal to one. And the last one I'm going to show you, whoops, um, let's say x is 0.9 repeated. Okay, we're going to start with that. So if I have x equal to 0.9 repeated, if I multiply both sides by 10, would you agree that that just moved the decimal place over and you would have 9.9 .9 repeated? Okay? Then, if on the left side I subtract x, on the number side I'd subtract 0.9 repeated. Does that make sense? Everything good so far? Uh, what's 10x minus x? 9x. 9.9 repeated minus a 0.9 repeated would just leave you with 9. Divide by 9 and you get x is equal to 1. But what did I start with? I started with x was 0.9 repeated, and I got x is equal to 1. They're the same number. Now, technically, for two numbers to be, every time you have two numbers that are different, there always exists another number in between. Because if those two numbers are different, you could like split the difference, cut it in half, put that a new number in between. There is no number between 0.9 repeated and 1. They're exactly the same number. You can't. You can't insert any number in between them. So from now on, who's your science teacher? Well, I shouldn't say that. But you could answer. If the answer is 3, you could write 2.9 repeated, and it would be the same answer. But you'll still lose marks from your science teacher. So maybe it's not a good idea. And the oh, yeah. And then they yeah, throw me under the bus. <laughs> Get me in trouble. 
All right, so that's off topic number one. I have like two off topic things for today, I'm sorry. Okay, next one. If negative 12 over three comma y is a point on the unit circle and it's in quadrant three, can you find y? Well, we know it's in quadrant three, so I can draw an angle in quadrant three, point on the unit circle in quadrant three, and we can use another of our big ideas. What's the x-coordinate? x-coordinate's cos, so I know cos is equal to negative 12 over 13 in quadrant 3. That means I can draw a triangle, label my reference angle, and since cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, I could label this as 12 and this as 13. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The numbers are too big, 13 squared, 169, 12 squared, 144, it ends up being squared of 25, which is so nice, it's 5, isn't that pretty? Just like it's all whole numbers, that's what I get off topic again on, sorry. Okay, so we got 5, 12, and 13. The unit circle actually would be tiny here. Can you see if this length is 13, my unit circle is actually small right there because a unit circle has a radius of 1. But it doesn't matter whether you use this little triangle. That little triangle has a radius of 1, and this side would be 12 over 13, or the big triangle. And I actually prefer using the bigger triangle because from this, I can say that sine of theta opposite over hypotenuse, negative because it's in quadrant 3. So sine of theta is negative 5 over 13. I haven't solved the question yet because what did the question ask me to find? Y. Can you see yourself doing this? You know that Y is sine theta, so you just write sine theta equals, but you don't actually acknowledge y equals negative 5 over 13. They are equal in this case, but is that something that you knew two years ago? Right? So you still have to show that you know that, because that's part of the thing that, yes, they are the same thing, but so is 1.9 repeated, and 2, and you wouldn't have written 1.9 repeated on your test yesterday, but you could have, but don't do that. <laughs> Only if you write out all the nines. <laughs> Not done yet. I have more time. Okay. Do you want to talk about pretty triangles? Yeah? Okay. This, this is the first pretty triangle that you were ever introduced to. You've seen that one before? The other side is 5. And then you could double it. 6, 8, 10 is the same thing. And triple it, 9, 12, 15. They're all the same triangle, just bigger or smaller. Okay? You just saw the second one. Today, 5, 12, 13. Now, I'm going to show you a third one that follows the same pattern, and you have to try to figure out things about the fourth one. So there's one with 7, 24, and 25. So your job is to try and tell me, what do you think some of the sides are on the next one? Even if you can only see one of the sides, that's fine. Any ideas what you think the next one would have? Yes. Now it's going to be 9. Good. Noticing going up by 2. So now you're going to give me ideas for the other sides, but you have to back them up with the pattern that you see. 
all have nice numbers. This is just one pattern of them. I find them fascinating whenever they appear. Um, this one doesn't fit the pattern. There's a new one. Oh, so then there's, it's a different set of patterns. So then you have to see, what can you find with ones like that? Ooh. Oh, I don't even I don't even know what the next one in that sequence is off the top of my head. Back to what we were doing. One of the things that we deal with this year is big angles or angles that go past 360 degrees. And in order to figure out what they are, we need to know what quadrant they're in so we can use the cast rule. So if you had something like 4,300 degrees, that's really hot. No, it's angle, actually. We're very big angle. You could, if you had a calculator, divide by 360 and find out you went 11 full times 0.94 around. How many revolutions 4,300 is? Does it make sense that once you get this decimal, that that 0.94 indicates that it's in quadrant 4? Because you go all the way around from 0 to 0.25 would be quadrant 1, 0.25 to 0.5 would be quadrant 2, and so on and so on. So if you had a calculator, this would be easy to say which quadrant it's in. If you didn't have a calculator, what you would probably do is start with 4,300 and start subtracting 360 until you got to an angle that you recognized. I would probably... If I was doing mental math, I would probably subtract 360 10 times in this case. That would leave me with 700 degrees. Then I'd say, oh, I'm going to subtract 360 again. Leaves me with 340 degrees. So now I would say, oh, that's in quadrant four. Coterminal co means the angle ends in the same place. So 340 degrees is the first positive angle that ends in the same place as 4,300 degrees. Okay? That's 340 degrees? That might be <laughs> 4,300 degrees. Needed to go around 11 times, and then, no. Right, and then you get hypnotized. No. In radians, we often have to do these without a calculator. I mean, you could type this into your calculator. Negative 23 pi over 6 divided by 2 pi, and get negative 1.91. So if you went in the negative direction, negative 1, another 0.91, can you see that you would end in quadrant 1? Thinking going in the negative direction, negative 1.9. Does that make sense that that would be quadrant 1? But this one we're going to do without a calculator more often. And the way and the technique that we're going to use is take the fraction and change it to a mixed fraction. So negative 23 pi over 6 is the same as negative 3 and 5 6 pi. And instead of thinking about whole revolutions, pi is only halfway around. So if I have, starting here in the negative direction, if I go to here, this would be negative pi. I go all the way around, that would be negative 2 pi. This would be negative 3 pi. And then, so I need to go negative 3 and 5, 6. And because this is more than half, it has to be in quadrant 1. And the nice thing about radians is that you will know right away that this is coterminal. What is the pi over 6 family in quadrant 1? Pi over 6. 
the really nice thing about radians is you could quickly tell the reference angle. With 4,300 degrees, could you tell that it was a 20 degree reference angle easily? Oh yeah, no problem. With 340, it's not hard to see that the reference angle is 20. But 4,300, not easy to tell that the reference angle is 20. With radians, negative 23 pi over 6, I can tell right away the reference angle is pi over 6. If it was negative 37 pi over 4, I can tell right away the reference angle is pi over 4. If the fraction reduces, like if I had um, 8 pi over 6, that reduces to 4 pi over 3, it's part of the pi over 3 family. So the fraction does have to be in lowest terms for that to work, but in these cases it was. So I have an assignment for you to practice this. I'll hand it out and then we'll do a couple together. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so assignment, it has two assignments. Assignment number one says whenever it says sine and cos, ignore it. And all they want you to do is find out what quadrant it's in and what angle it's coterminal with the first time around. So in other words, if we look at question one, 13 pi over 6. If we think of 13 pi over 6 as a mixed fraction, it's 2 and 1 sixth pi. If we think of our unit circle, this would be pi, this would be 2 pi, so this is 1 pi, 2 pi, and a sixth more is going to end in quadrant 1. So for this one, assignment 1, you'd say this is in quadrant 1. What's it coterminal with? What's the pi over 6 family in quadrant 1? Obviously pi over 6. We'll do a bigger one, like number 5. Let's do 5 together. 101 pi over 4. 101 pi over 4. As a mixed fraction, 25 and 1 quarter pi. Now, I'm not going to draw all 25 circles because you're going to get yourself dizzy. Okay, have you noticed a pattern that there are odd numbers here and even numbers here? So if I was going 25 pi in the positive direction, I would end here. And I would still need to go one quarter more, would end in quadrant three. What's the pi over four family member in quadrant three? Five pi over four. If you can figure out, hey, quadrant three, it's always one more than the denominator. Like pi over six in quadrant three, seven pi over six. Pi over three, four pi over three. Pi over four, five pi over four. So that's one of the patterns to help you figure out your unit circle. Then when you get to assignment two, assignment two, questions one to eight, find the coordinates on the unit circle. So for example, since we already know it's coterminal with pi over six, my coordinates are going to be root three over two comma one half. For five pi over four, my coordinates are negative root two over two, negative root two over two. You might have to use your sheet right now, but eventually you'd want to see if you could have them memorized. And then once you get to a question like these ones with sine and cos, 
like number 9, it says sine of negative pi over 4. You would say that's in quadrant 4. It's going to be negative root 2 over 2. All right. So we'll work the rest of class on that.